that disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Epstein took his own life while he was behind bars in New York City facing charges of sex trafficking. Well, those were the shocking headlines almost exactly a year ago this month when the billionaire sex offender Jeffrey Epstein killed himself in a jail in New York. The circumstances were so bizarre that many people believe he was actually murdered. Either way, he didn't live to face justice and his victims were cheated out of a trial. Just two days before his death, Epstein apparently took steps to cheat them again in another way. With the help of his lawyers who often visited him in jail, he changed his will, transferring his vast fortune to a trust fund which would likely make it even harder for them to get compensation. Over half a billion dollars worth of cash and assets were moved with a stroke of his pen. Since then, the Epstein estate has actually helped to establish a victim's compensation fund. But according to one of our guests, Epstein's former boss, the estate controls far more money than they're letting on. We'll find out what he knows in a moment, and we'll hear from a former FBI financial investigator on how to trace the rest of the money, if indeed it exists. We'll also hear from a lawyer for some of Epstein's alleged victims. But first, a quick reminder of the sheer size of Epstein's fortune and the mystery surrounding how he made it. Accused sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein is dead. Prison officials uh, found Jeffrey Epstein in his cell uh, apparently, he had uh, hanged himself. As questions swirl around his death, attention is shifting now to his estate. Where are the assets? We know about the properties he has. He's got an island to himself in the U.S. Virgin Islands. In Manhattan, he has a home on the Upper East Side. He has uh, one in Palm Beach, Florida, a ranch in New Mexico as well as a home in Paris. Court papers say his estate is valued at more than $577 million, including more than $56 million in cash. How on earth did Epstein make all of his money? So all that we really know about Jeffrey Epstein is that he started as an options trader at Bear Stearns, and then he became the money manager for people, including Les Wexler, who owns the parent company of Victoria's Secret. Somehow he agreed to hire Jeffrey Epstein to manage all of his finances. You know, when you talk about Jeffrey Epstein, there's so much we don't know, particularly about his finances. We know that he was a paid consultant, at the very least, for a firm called uh, Towers Financial. They were a New York City uh, financial firm. Uh, and the company participated in what was, at the time, the largest Ponzi scheme in American history. Stephen Hoffenberg, the CEO, says Epstein was the brains behind the operation. Mm -hmm. He set up the whole Ponzi scheme. All his money comes from crimes. Shockingly, he signed a will just two days before he killed himself in a New York jail. Epstein put all of his holdings in a trust. His alleged victims are now vowing to go after those assets, saying they should be distributed. Since Epstein's death now means there will be no trial on criminal charges. Well, let's bring in our guest now. And Stephen Hoffenberg was Epstein's boss and mentor during some of the 80s and 90s. Frank Worrell is a former FBI financial investigator, and Eric Fudali is a lawyer at the Bloom firm, which represents some of Epstein's alleged victims. Now, we are having some technical difficulties, but don't worry, Mr. Hoffenberg is there. But we are going to start with Eric first. Eric, how much money is the Epstein estate making available for the Victims' Compensation Fund? I've actually heard a few numbers. Uh, it ranges anywhere from around $550 million to around $670 million. Those are the figures I've heard that are in the estate and available. So that would represent most of the known estate? To my knowledge, yes. At least that's what's been made public, and that's what's been uh, recorded in the, as, as the estate in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Now, it's reported that 70 uh, women have already registered for the fund. Is that still a, a, a contemporary number? That sounds right to me. Uh, the Bloom firm, uh, my firm, uh, currently represents six victims. It's also reported that there are no, no limits to the payouts. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, from the, what the program has told us and from what the estate has told us, the program is not bound by any cap or limit on the amount of money they can provide to each victim as a whole. Right. So how will it be determined, victim by victim, um, how much 
someone should be paid? Well, that's sort of the, the magic question here, right? Uh, from what the program has told us, they will be considering a lot of factors. Primarily, it will be what sort of evidence uh, we have available. That evidence can range from uh, declarations from witnesses, contemporaneous reports, uh, and also uh, you know therapy records, medical records, that type of thing. So it's going to come down to to evidence that you know the timing of the claims, the veracity of the claims, right. how well they present it. And who's running the fund? Who is responsible for making the decision about who gets compensation and who doesn't? So it, it is a fund run by a, 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 it's a three-person panel, and they've also used a, uh, a child advocate by the name of Marcy Hamilton, who they're associating with. And it's the same people, uh, the, it's Ken Feinberg's firm, it's the same people who did the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, and they also have experience in allocating funds to clergy uh, sexual abuse victims for the Catholic G Church. Given that it could... Uh, swallow up the entire Epstein estate, it begs the question why Epstein's estate would agree to setting up such a fund. In fact, they wanted the fund. What's in it for them? That's, that's true. Uh, at every step of the way in this process, the estate has encouraged and recommended that the victims go through with the fund. Certainly, technically, it could uh, wipe out the entire estate. I certainly hope it does, and I don't think the estate of Jeffrey Epstein should go to anyone but the many, many victims whose lives he ruined. Is it conceivable, though, that the fund runs out of money before everyone is compensated? It certainly is. You know, I, I, I don't think it will. There is a lot of money there. You know, of course, no amount of money is, is enough to compensate for what these victims have gone through. But there certainly is a risk that eventually they, they could run out of money. But, you know, Epstein's, Epstein's estate is, is very vast. And, and I have a feeling that there will be plenty to, to compensate the victims. Uh, Stephen Hoffenberg, you actually think that Epstein's even more vast than they say it is and that they're hiding much more money. What makes you think that? Well, it's more than hiding. There's no certified audit by an accounting established firm that showed us how they came up with the cash. They're saying there's $634 million in various bank accounts now with no CPA, financial statement, nothing to certify this. So there's no question that they liquidated assets to get the $634 million amount. But I know for a fact there's substantially more assets around the world. And there is money laundering, which is the claim being made against this estate. And the estate is being run by Warner Jeffrey Epstein's co-defendants, Darren Indyke, which is outrageous for anybody to accept. Now, you say that you can help investigators find more of Epstein's money. How would you go about doing that? We would do a forensic audit of the assets for the years that Epstein was in charge. I'm familiar with the assets. I'm familiar with the process that Epstein used. And we would do the required review and research into every asset. You're dealing with a revenue question of far above $100 billion over the timeline of Epstein's business. So this is very available and needs to be done. The Virgin Islands are not undertaking a forensic audit. Now and you, it has to be really done in America. Uh, now because you, there's just too much money laundering here. So what would you estimate his fortune to be at then, if not near half a billion or near $600 million? What would you put it at? I would put it uh, far above a billion dollars right now. And it could be much greater because we're talking about over 20 years of monetary buildup. Mm. And I know some of the transactions he participated in, they're much greater than what's been reported. Mm. There's no evidence. There's no supporting financial statements. There's no certified audit. There's nothing. Now, your claims have been widely publicized in national newspapers around the world, uh, but one of the lawyers for the executives of, of the estate have dismissed your claim, saying after spending 18 years behind bars for being a fraudster, Hoffenberg is not a reliable source and his story is completely false. What would you say to that? The uh, claim that you just repeated was an error 
because the article was confusing that he was citing. I did not say at any time that the estate had over $100 billion in value. What I was discussing, which was in the last chapter of the article that he was quoting, was that the revenue, the amount of turnover of the money over the over 20 years was above $100 billion. So he attacked me thinking that I was saying there was $100 billion available today. That's not what I said. The reporter was a little bit confused because his story conflicted with different paragraphs. Right. What I'm saying, which I'm sure the lawyers will support, that a certified financial statement will support above a billion dollars. And once we get a total accounting and a forensic audit, we'll see way above a billion dollars. So he's not really attacking me on any grounds. Now, you said that if the money is found, the state should seize it and give it to the victims. I just want to know, on what legal basis could it be seized? Well, there's claims filed currently in the Virgin Islands courts. Those claims could be filed in the New York City federal courts to create a seizure of money laundering. In any other case like this, where there is this type of dollars on the table, there would be an appropriate certified financial firm doing this work, a major accounting firm, and there would be enough evidence for a seizure. We have Darren Indyke, the co-executive, running the estate, who's the co-conspirator of Jeffrey Epstein for over 20 years. This is outrageous misconduct, and it's got to be stopped. The money laundering has to be stopped. Let's pick that up now with Frank Morell. He's uh, tracked down money for the FBI over many years. Uh, Mr. Morell, how would you go about tracking these hidden sums of money, if indeed they do exist? Well, the beauty is that the FBI, which gets first crack at this, the criminal investigation will stay all the civil suits. And you have already, you can see through the progress of the two indictments, which were a year apart, July of 2019, July of 2020 with Maxwell, you can see the FBI is progressing already with the assets that they're planning on seizing. So I think a lot of that is being done already. I would not be shocked to see either a a superseding indictment or a new indictment come out as new records uh, are are, uh, reviewed by the FBI to see participants and money coming in to Epstein. As far as the past earnings uh, that Epstein had, most of that is beyond the statute of limitations. So it might as well be from interest from U.S. Treasury bonds. They're not going to get that. But the uh, additional funds that might have come in during the time of this conspiracy, which is what it's named in the indictments, uh, that will be tracked. And any uh, third party, there'll, there'll be plenty of, of uh, forensic accounting that... Stephen's suggesting yeah. by the FBI, and that's good news for not only the victims, but for these civil suits that will be going forward. I think some people might be a little skeptical about the FBI's appetite to go after uh, this case because, frankly, Mr. Hoffenberg and, and uh, Jeffrey Epstein, according to Mr. Hoffenberg, were putting together a Ponzi scheme um, and when that collapsed and it was revealed, only Mr. Hoffenberg was in the frame and went to jail for some 18 years. Nobody went after uh, Epstein. Why didn't the FBI, and you were in in the uh, Bureau at the time, go after him? I would say it's pretty unusual that only one person would come out indicted in a case so large. Uh, In fact, there's usually an appetite to go after as much as you can and for as much money as you can, and even the assets of the participants in the scheme. Not sure why. So, yes, the FBI had 
uh, a, a chance in the SEC to go, you know, a bite of the apple. Then they had a second bite of the apple later uh, with Epstein. Now they're going for a third bite. But let me give you some reasons to be confident that they're going to consume the apple. The head of the FBI is uh, in New York is Assistant Director William Sweeney. I know Bill Sweeney. Sweeney is incorruptible. He's a great investigator on his own. I've worked with him in Newark for many years. I'm actually personal friends with uh, both him and his family. He'll get to the bottom of this, and the media is all over, and they've already uh, uncovered a lot. But if you look carefully at the progress of the two different indictments, really it's one investigation, it looks like they're, they're, they're going after forfeiture. It's prominent, it's named, and uh, they're substitute assets. So they're going to be a, uh, quite a bit taken into the criminal investigation. Now that money coming in will go first to a, the victim witnesses, right? The victims in this thing, and it will be fairly dispersed. Then the lawyers will go after in the civil cases. Uh, Mr. Hoffenberg, we've just heard a former FBI agent there talking about the possible seizure. Frank. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, what is your reaction to that? That's incredible breaking news by Frank, the former FBI agent, explaining to the audience that there's going to be a forfeiture in the New York Southern District of New York federal courts proceeding by the FBI, who I know are doing a great job, and they have the skill set to do the forensic audit to seize the assets to benefit the victims and benefit all of the parties in this case, which the United States of America deserves its fines in this case. So that's breaking news, that there's going to be a seizure of the assets by the FBI and by the Justice Department in America of this money laundering scheme that's taking place. This second, the money laundering scheme is ongoing criminal misconduct. Uh, Stephen Hoffenberg is going to be staying with us as we now focus on his relationship with Jeffrey Epstein during the 80s and 90s which was crucial to Epstein's rise in wealth and influence. To this day, how Jeffrey Epstein made his money is shrouded in secrecy, but a few details are clear. Behind him were two key figures, Leslie Wexner, and before him, Stephen Hoffenberg. Hoffenberg hired Epstein to Towers Financial in 1987, a debt collection agency he'd set up in the 1970s. The high points of Towers Financial include an unsuccessful attempt to take over Pan Am and rescuing the New York Post from bankruptcy. Hoffenberg actually took ownership of the paper, albeit briefly. The two men worked together closely for around nine years. Over that period, the older man showed his protege the high life. Hoffenberg owned a private jet and numerous luxury properties in New York and Florida. but. In 1993, Towers Financial collapsed. It had been revealed finally as a Ponzi scheme. Hoffenberg was arrested and pleaded guilty to swindling investors out of $475 million. Epstein, though, was never charged. While Hoffenberg spent 18 years in prison, Epstein, allegedly, used the ill-gotten gains from Towers to set up his own hedge fund, J. Epstein & Co. It managed money for billionaires only, Yet, the only billionaire client we know about is Leslie Wexner, who would come under Epstein's spell and give him full power of attorney over his affairs and access to more money than he could ever dream of. OK, let's return to Stephen Hoffenberg now. Uh, Mr Hoffenberg, you have described uh, Jeffrey Epstein as a master manipulator, someone who is totally ruthless and motivated to become extremely rich. Is that what you liked about him when you hired him for nearly $50,000 a month? Is, is that what you valued in him, his ability to manipulate others? What I was told to do by Sir Douglas Lease, who was a principal in Towers Financial, was to hire Jeffrey Epstein 
and that he had the incredible skill set that you just described. He was unbelievable in his ability to manipulate people. He manipulated President Donald Trump. He manipulated Prince Andrew. He did an incredible job of manipulation of Leslie Wexner and myself and Sir Douglas Lease, who we, he was about to blackmail. And you went down for some 18 years for the Ponzi scheme, and you say that he was just as much a part of it as you were, and yet he got away scot-free. How have you... How can you explain that, even to this day? The Washington Post ran a story about the last 30 years between Epstein and myself and what occurred. The grand jury minutes, which I was not able to receive at that time frame, and I needed them in order to make my case in court, and they were withheld from me, the grand jury minutes seized me identifying every step that Jeffrey Epstein did in Towers Financial that was money laundering and securities crimes. Once Jeffrey Epstein saw that he was going to get indicted, his name was removed to, from the file in the grand jury minutes. His name was removed from the case in front of the court, and it was replaced with co-conspirator. His actual name, Jeffrey Epstein, was taken off the court case, and it was replaced with the title or name of co-conspirator. That evidence is now available, and there is no explanation for that occurring. When did you find out that he was abusing young women and girls? Well, that started to be exposed in the late 80s and very heavily in the early 90s. And that's a tragedy, an incredible tragedy. And that would have been stopped if his name was not removed from this case that took place in 96 and 97. There would have been no opportunity for him to do this terrible raping of young girls. Did you know if his case name was left in the file for the judge to see it? Did you know about his disgusting behavior when you were working with him? The time line is close, and there were reports of him, Epstein, Jeffrey, doing the raping in the media that alerted me in the late 80s and early 90s. That was a clear fact. That was absolutely taking place. That was reported. Some of uh, uh, Jeffrey Epstein's alleged victims say that he had cameras everywhere on his properties and that he videoed powerful men uh, d you know, sexually abusing uh, young women and girls uh, in order to make money. Uh, do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. I, and I've uh, spoken with the eyewitnesses, and I was very aware from actual witnesses reporting to me that the films were taken in all the homes and were transported to Ohio for distribution and safekeeping? The answer is yes, that's all true. The FBI knows that. There's no doubt that there was filmmaking done of the powerful people and the raping of the young girls. So you expect, yes. do you expect these tapes to come out soon? And what legal mechanism will be used to release them, if so? If the FBI could do what they wanted, they would release all the evidence. The FBI has the evidence, and they understand it, and they can release it. The question is if the politicians will allow the release of the evidence. Uh, Stephen Hoffenberg, we've nearly run out of time. Let me ask you a final question. As we approach the anniversary of his apparent suicide, may I ask you, do you think that Jeffrey Epstein killed himself? There's been experts, medical examiners, that have come in and said that was not a suicide. Mark Epstein has said that was not a suicide. 
Jelaine Maxwell has said that was not a suicide. There's only been one expert in New York City that said it was a suicide. All of the other experts have said that was not a suicide. So I read the reports of the experts, and they're very explicit. They said he did not kill himself. Uh, Stephen Hoffenberg, thank you so much for your contributions today to The Nectus. And thank you at home for watching. Remember, you can see this and all our previous episodes on our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>